Our next speaker will be Tony Capone, who's going to talk about ROP in adolescents and adults. These are my financial disclosures, and none of them pertinent to the current discussion. There we go. Thank you. Uh, Drs. Tracy and Ferrone, uh, members and guests, good afternoon. The history of treatment of ROP, uh, dating from its uh, description in the 1940s, is actually relatively short. In the 1980s, we learned from the cryo-ROP study that peripheral retinal ablation was an effective way to manage ROP. And in the uh, 1990s and early 2000s, we pretty much did the same thing, just a little differently. We learned from the ETROP that earlier treatment is better, and uh, the new millennium has ushered in the era of pharmacologic therapy for ROP, uh, culminating uh, relatively recently with uh, the publication of the uh, Rainbow Study data speaking to the use of ranibizumab for acute ROP. Uh, formerly premature adolescents and adults uh, have unique clinical findings based on when they were born, whether they were treated, and how. The first generation, that one of spontaneous involution, dating to prior to the era of peripheral retinal ablation, is in its mid-30s and older. And if it had uh, individuals who had active ROP in this generation, if it resolved, did so spontaneously. The ablation generation dates to the mid-1980s, and children whose ROP was treated, with pharma treated pharmacologically are just now entering their teens. Kaiser and Tracy. Uh, uh, published a classification system speaking to the involutional changes of ROP when it resolves spontaneously. Their series, as well as that of Smith and Tasman, spoke to the frequency of peripheral retinal pathology in this patient cohort. Peripheral fi or, uh, posterior uh, segment findings can include vascular straightening, pigment stippling, cicatricial changes, posterior pole changes, and macular ectopia, just to name a few. Uh, with macular ectopia's OCT correlate of a flattened uh, fovea and flattened clivus. One of the most important take-home points in this presentation is that even with minimal posterior pole findings from ROP, former prematures with regressed ROP are at high risk of retinal tear detachment throughout their lives. Of note in light of that is the low success rate in the management of retinal attachment in formerly premature adults when sclerobuckle is chosen as the exclusive therapeutic modality. For the ablation generation, the best data to date still uh, remain the cryo-ROP data, uh, and still treated eyes fared better than controlled eyes, even at, at 15 years as compared to 10. However, there is ongoing gradual progression of unfavorable structural outcomes in both groups, retinal folds and retinal detachment, how structural outcome, uh, up, unfavorable structural outcome was defined, continued to occur uh, after age 10. Of interest, in the group of 13 children on the bottom line, Four of them had posterior poles that had, were essentially normal at the 10-year examination mark. I'd like to spend uh, the rest of my time speaking about two important themes in the management of late complications of ROP, and that's the importance of the hyaloid and avascular periphery, and I'll illustrate, illustrate these points using cases. The first is one of focal hyaloidal contraction. This is a 45-year-old year old Caucasian woman who uh, experienced a three-month decline in visual acuity. This composite color photo nicely shows the opacified taut posterior hyaloid, and the 3D OCT rendition nicely demonstrates the vitreofovial uh, traction and the resulting foveal macular detachment. These eyes can fare quite well uh, uh, post-surgically, as evidenced by this uh, post-operative image pair. The other type of hyaloidal contraction is diffuse, and this has a fairly unique appearance in retinopathy of prematurity in infancy. It uh, has a tendency to be bilateral and symmetrical. Uh, it's flat uh, contraction of the hyaloid with this opaque gray appearance. The retina is flatly detached beneath it. It's managed by hyaloidal delamination. The hyaloid is thick, the retina quite thin, and the retina needs to thin further following surgery for retinal uh, reattachment. Consequently, these eyes often look better than they see, and unfortunately, vision is commonly in the light perception only range. When you have uh, DHC in adults, uh, the contraction tends to be more focal. Note the graying change uh, over the uh, macula and the inferior arcades. The OCT demonstrates nicely the quite thickened uh, hyaloid and the chronic intraretinal changes. These, these, these are the uh, postoperative day one images that show that it's indeed possible to uh, relieve the traction from the interretinal surface. However, these eyes, while they fare better than the infants, still don't fare as well as one would like because of the chronic interretinal changes seen in the prior OCT. Lastly, let me speak a bit about peripheral retinal avascularity. 
This was primarily encountered, pre encountered previously in untreated eyes with incomplete regression of subthreshold disease. Now we see it somewhat commonly in anti-VEGF treated eyes without complete peripheral uh, vascularization because that occurs in up to 97 percent of anti-VEGF treated eyes as demonstrated by Moshevegi and colleagues. Thus, while a potent tool, there remain concerns with regard to persistent uh, avascular uh, periphery, the risk of late and very late uh, reactivation, prompting some clinicians to apply laser in eyes like this that remain with some peripheral retinal avascularity past 55 to 60 weeks of age in the interest of bringing the disease to a treatment terminus. Another consideration is the development of lattice degeneration-like changes in avascular retina in a former prematures, uh, and now in the uh, anti-VEGF generation, there are a number with avascular retina. Things that we don't know is, will it occur in the same frequency uh, that we've seen uh, in other uh, spontaneously regressed prematures, and with what severity? Um, and uh, as there are no 30-year-olds uh, formally treated with anti-VEGFs, uh, we cannot speak to that yet, but our concern, of course, is that we'll see more of this. Uh, a monocular 17-year-old had an asymptomatic regmatogenous detachment due to lattice changes in his avascular periphery. OCT demonstrates that the fovea was encroached. Fortunately, he fared well with a buccal impetrectomy both anatomically and functionally. To, to conclude then, the range of late ROP-related clinical findings relate to when former prematures were born, whether they were treated and how. Eyes with minimal cicatricial changes remain at high risk for tear and detachment and posterior hyaloidal contraction and peripheral retinal avascularity figure prominently in the fate of such eyes. As they need to be followed essentially for the duration, they should be considered forever premature. Thanks for your attention.